Okay, and I started the transcript. So that's available for folks who need it. Welcome, welcome everyone. Let's see, I think I'll get started. Folks will probably still be filtering in and that is okay. And as always, I don't want to take tons of time away from the presenters. Um, so, sorry, I'm letting people in. Tracy, do you mind letting folks in while I, okay, thank you, thumbs up from Tracy, thank you so much. Okay, I am Katie Dichter. You probably have seen or met me before. I'm a full-time librarian at Seattle Central. I'm so, so happy to be helping out with the COSIs this quarter. COSI is one of the gems of Central that's been going for over 10 years. Uh, thanks to my colleagues, Kelly McHenry, and Kimberly Tate Malone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, today's COSI is on memory and movement building. And in a moment, um, our presenters, our guest Nathaniel Moore from the Freedom Archives in Berkeley, California, and tenured history faculty member Tracy Lai will lead us in a conversation about archives, activism, memory and movement building, as the name would suggest. Uh, I'll do a brief land and labor acknowledgement we acknowledge the unceded land we live on as the home of the Coast Salish people, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I encourage all of you and us as a community to consider what it means to be guests on this land, to make for yourselves every land acknowledgement active in some way, internalize it in some way in the way that makes sense for you, and um, you can also pay real rent to the Duwamish tribe. And I'll put a link in the chat to real rent in just a moment. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent. We recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor and immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of our country and who continue to serve within our labor force. Uh, I also wanna say a special shout out to my colleague, Dave Ellenwood, who, uh, who nudged this COSI into existence and who I can honestly say doesn't get enough nudges, deserves nudges every day and shout outs. Um, Dave, you're awesome, special and amazing, and I'm so glad you're my colleague. Uh, Dave is friends with Nathaniel, our, one of our guests from way back. And I'm sure there are many stories to be told there <laughs> and archived. We'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, so um, maybe a little bit more about Nathaniel and Tracy. I said some, but Nathaniel Moore is an archivist and co-director at the Freedom Archives in Berkeley, California. We'll hear more about his work and what's happening down there. And Tracy Lai, Tracy, thank you so much for all that you give to COSI. This is your second COSI of the quarter. I feel so appreciative for your knowledge and wisdom and what you bring to the college and the community. So I will turn it over to both of you, put some links in the chat and just be an active listener. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, I guess I'm I'm going first, so I'll I'll do my thing and then I'll pass it to Tracy. Um, I also just want to acknowledge uh, all the folks that helped make this possible. So thank you, Dave. Thank you, Katie and uh, Tracy. It's really nice to uh, share this space with you and, and be in conversation as the event goes on. Uh, and and thanks to all the folks who who showed up. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and just kind of generally introduce myself uh, very quickly again, and then uh, I'm going to start a PowerPoint to um, talk a little bit about our topic today, which is uh, memory and movement building, uh, which I'm uh, happy to be here uh, representing the Freedom Archives and talk about. Uh, so as, as Katie mentioned, uh, I'm Nathaniel. Uh, I'm an archivist and co-director at the Freedom Archives. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the 
work we did around a documentary called Symbols of Resistance and the subsequent uh, activism of students on the C Boulder campus to uh, memorialize the uh, uh, efforts and, and deaths of uh, six student activists in the 1970s. And I'll explain a little bit how our work uh, helped serve as a catalyst for some of that. And then we'll, uh, we'll relate that to, you know, some of the um, stories and uh, moments that you may be talking about here in uh, Seattle and at Seattle Central. So give me a second here. I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, can folks see my screen? Okay, fantastic. Um, so again, thanks for, for inviting the Freedom Archives to, to share with you today. Um, so at the Freedom Archives, uh, our motto is preserve the past, illuminate the present and shape the future. And I'm gonna use that model to kind of talk about uh, three of the general types of work that we do. Uh, so we're a social movement archive located in Berkeley, California. Uh, we just recently moved to Berkeley from San Francisco, but in totality, we've been around about 22 years. And the main thing that we want to engage in at the Freedom Archives is preserving the voices and movements of resistance and struggle, uh, not just in the United States, but also internationally. And um, we, we really like to focus on movements between the 1960s and 90s, although you know, we've got materials from all different types of things. Um, and so to the point of preserve the past, we are a, in, an archive, right? So if you look behind me, you'll see I'm sitting in our studio room where we've got uh, old format uh, audio equipment and video equipment. So we can actually listen to reel to reels that may have been recorded during the 1960s. Uh, we can watch different 16 millimeter video that might've been shot at a protest or a rally in the 70s. Uh, we can also watch early uh, kind of porta pack videos um, that might have been done in the 80s of different political meetings or um, interviews with an imprisoned activist. And so uh, we, we have lots of paper materials as well, but as an archive, we really uh, strive to preserve these materials so that whether it be researchers, students, or community members can engage them for generations to come. So the illuminate the present piece then really is where we somewhat start differing from other more traditional archives. Um, we don't just see it as our, our role to uh, steward the, the resources of the past. We really understand the continuity that most of these social movements and struggles are taking place. It's not just a past piece. All the history is still happening today. And even if we don't recognize it, the things that we do today become the history for tomorrow. And so one of the things that we want to do is actively use these archival materials to help us better understand present day struggles and present day movements that are happening right now. So uh, helping people draw the continuities, not just between the repression that we may face, but also the long legacies of rich uh, resistance that in this country have been taking place for hundreds and hundreds of years since uh, Native peoples first started to uh, defend their land from when enslaved Africans were first uh, taken here forcibly. Uh, resistance you know, has been happening for generations. And so in fact, we see that our work today is building on the work of others that have been doing this work and not necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel, but by better informing ourselves of what happened before us and how we fit into that legacy, be able to um, you know, be stronger and, and more uh, informed and you know, really build the, the, fab, the fabric of resistance. And again, not just think that we're kind of overwhelmed by uh, you know, all the, the many, many kind of dynamic events around us that seem overwhelming. So when we're doing that work to then repurpose archival materials to better understand this future, that might be like making documentaries, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. That might be um, 
uh, putting materials in our online database so that researchers and community members can uh, engage with the narratives of people who came before them. This might be creating curricula for classrooms. Uh, if you visit our website, www.freedomarchives.org, you'll see a lot of the projects that we do and the materials that we're engaging in. And so then the final piece of our motto is then, okay, great, so we're preserving these materials, we're making educational stuff with them. This sounds great, but for what purpose, right? And so for the purpose of well, we see ourselves as a part of these movements that are taking place. And so we actively wanna shape the future by drawing on the past. And so whether that be our internship program where we have young people come into the archives to actually learn archival management skills and engage with these histories, uh, whether that be uh, uh, providing folks with resources to uh, within the issues that they may be working on, which again, I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a moment here, uh, we're actively, we're always actively looking to the future and trying to um, support the vision that those have to move forward, uh, again, because we see ourselves as a part of movements and a part of this legacy of resistance and not just solely based in preserving historical materials. So that's just some of the work we do at the Freedom Archives. Again, you can check out our website. We also have an online database where all of our materials are held. And so if you're doing research or creating re toolkits or whatever you may be doing, don't hesitate to, to check out the stuff that we've got. So what I wanna do right now is momentarily move away from the Freedom Archives and the work we're doing and talk about a historical event that we will then intersect with uh, 40 years after it actually happened. And so uh, for the next minute or so, I'm gonna talk about Los Ace de Boulder. Uh, you'll see the pictures of nine young people on the screen. Los Ace de Boulder are the bottom two rows of people. And Los Ace de Boulder, Boulder refers to six uh, student activists who were killed in May of 1974 during a weeks long occupation of a campus building on the CU Boulder campus. And the reason why students were uh, occupying that building is because at that time, Chicano representation, representation on campus was very low and the resources were almost non-existent. And so these students were demanding continued funding and growth for the program that brought them to campus and other student bodies on campus that were facing the same situation that they were. And so they occupied the student building with their demands for a number of weeks and the university really wasn't paying much attention to them and just kind of let them occupy the building. Um, and then a couple weeks into the occupation, uh, one of the evenings, three of the young people, Una Jacola, Reyes Martinez, and Never Romero were murdered in a car bombing that took place in a nearby park. Uh, two days after that, three additional uh, young activists who were participating in the occupation were killed in a car bomb uh, in the city of Boulder. Uh, there was another person that was in the car who was severely injured. Um, while these events severely shook the occupation as well as the student um, uh, mobilizations on campus, uh, the circumstances of their deaths were never investigated and their cases still to this day have never been solved. And so the way that the Freedom Archives intersects with those, that set of events was to honor uh, the 40 year anniversary of Los Ace de Boulder. We were actually invited to Colorado by a number of activists who had been some of the people who were occupying the movie, uh, the, the building during that time to actually film the anniversary, to interview participants. And that became uh, our documentary, Symbols of Resistance, uh, which basically focused on the history of the Chicano movement in Colorado and New Mexico, and was mainly focused on these young martyrs. And so Los Ace de Boulder was a major story in the film, but there were a number of other uh, young Chicano mar martyrs uh, from the student movement at that time, also whose murders were unsolved. And so we really used their stories to kind of talk about uh, both the historical movement but again, consistent with the work of the Freedom Archives to bring this into the present. During that time period was a huge uptake in terms of ICE raids, 
uh, in terms of repression against Chicano people in Colorado and the United States as a totality. And so this film really became a mobilization point and an organizing tool that activists in the community were using to educate people on their history. Many of people who understood the current set of conditions they were facing didn't necessarily know these stories or their histories in that particular way. And so this film was used to kind of help bring context to them. And so one of the unintended consequences of this, because after we made the film, we just put it out and in a good way, you know, I don't want to say we thought we were done, but that was kind of the work. And so, you know, we, we were moving on to doing other projects. Um, but one, you never know kind of once you put things out there, what's going to happen. And so a young person uh, who was doing a master's program at C. Boulder saw the film and realized that she had never heard of any of these stories or the bombings and also realized that there was nothing that the campus did to commemorate this. And so she worked together with uh, over 200 volunteers to both imagine a memorial that could be created to these young people and then to actually work on designing it. And they wanted to put this sculpture outside of the building that Vosace the Bolger had been occupying when they were murdered. And so the person who was a, a huge influence and designer of this project, Jasmine Betts, she's pictured, uh, you can see her on the screen. So, and here's also a picture of her working with um, many of the community members. And this work took place over many years. I believe it started in 2019 and, or maybe 2018, and was finally finished in 2020, where now you can see what the sculptures look like. And so they're tile mosaics of the six martyrs, along with some words to honor them and their names and talking a little bit about some of their contributions beyond, uh, you know, just being murdered because even though their lives were taken from them at a young age, already they were contributing so much to their communities. Here's uh, another picture of this and along you can see each particular mosaic face. You can see this, I'll share the link so that people can see this page later. Uh, let me back up and I'll just, and so then on the last slide, um, let me say this before I get to the last slide and start to wrap up. And so, uh, yes, it was really great to see the community come together and build these statues for this memorial, but even this process was not without challenge. And so while the university tacitly uh, agreed to put the statue there, at first it was just temporary. People had to remobilize years later to actually force the university to make it a permanent thing. And so again, showing really uh, student mobilization was at the heart of the successes uh, to push this campus to do things, not just in the 1970s, but also to then honor that 40 plus years later. Um, this really was a community product. So even though the Freedom Archives helped to create a material that was certainly foundational in catalyzing this project, this project is not our project. It's the project of the community and the people who worked on it. So again, it's more of the power of archives to activate as opposed to um, us doing something so great one way or the other. Um, so that's kind of the, the two second presentation. I can say more later during the discussion, uh, but if you want to learn more uh, and I'll provide these links so that Cozy can send them out, but we have a project page. You can also take a look at our website and then very in a very cool way, uh, your library has symbols of resistance at the library. And so if folks actually wanna watch the documentary y'all can definitely just get it out from your library and engage it. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw it to, uh, to Tracy. I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. Wow, Nathaniel, that is amazing. And it makes me feel really good about working in the field of history. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take a turn with sharing screen make sure that all works and um i am thinking about so many things right now um what well, one of the things is um one of the things is um maybe just taking making a connection to uh what happened 
with these students reclaiming space on their college campus. And to me, that is a connection with the campaign to save the Sudakawa Fountain. Um, there's a connection with symbols of resistance, and there is certainly a connection with memory and memorial and, and who is telling the story, who is telling that story. And Katie, when you talked about um, Kosi and mentioned Kelly McHenry, we need to document the history of Kosi because it is a symbol of resistance in that, and there will be in common a singular president, a former president, okay, which I will get to at president of Seattle Central. <clears throat> but the connection is that one of the catalysts for conversations on social issues was the refusal and the denial to continue what had been a very important program for faculty called the Global Education Design Team, GEDT. And it was a small budget, but 10,000 still sounds like kind of a lot to me. I don't know about you, maybe I'm not looking big enough, but. It was a small fund which faculty organized um, programs to do global education design, connect with community and so on. And when the program did not go forward under then president Paul Kilpatrick, there I said his name. <clears throat> well, then the librarian said, we have to still have something. We may not have a budget, but we will create a space. And what a space COSI has been. So thank you, librarian team. Thank you, all the classes, students, people who have come and contributed either in speaking or just soaking it up. So here we are. And, and now we're thinking about freedom archives, the power to tell our own stories and to do what needs to be done. So I would like to share a little bit about um, one of the many social justice struggles within the college. Oh my goodness, there are some going on right now, but that will be in a different COSI, I'm sure. And um, oh my gosh, is this Tina Young? I hope so. I mentioned to some of my compatriots uh, that I would have a chance to reflect on this campaign to save the Sudakawa Fountain. And um, oh, and I got to remove myself so you can actually see the image of the fountain. And Tina Young, if you are there, I do hope you will chime in with me. Um, Melanie King, Ken Matsudara, I could go on with a list of other people, but y'all were holding it together and all of our organizing together, along with many students, too many to name, is what means the fountain is still here. And so you're looking at an image and it's actually taken on a day when we were marking um, Japanese American Remembrance Day. Um, my next slide says a little bit more about that or a later slide does. But um, each of those candles represents one of the uh, approximately 200 Japanese American students who were essentially expelled from Broadway High School which is the site of, that's why we call the Broadway Edison building. That high school became the foundation of Seattle Central College. And so um, the fountain really embodies that experience. So just to share a little bit about the artist, the sculptor, George Sudakawa, I'm going to read a little bit, just a little bit, from a flyer we developed that we called why do we need to save the George Sudakawa Fountain? Okay, so uh, George was a student at Broadway High School and his art was first recognized when he was a student. He won first prize in a student work art competition sponsored by Scholastic Magazine, a national publication. And it was at Broadway High where he became friends with Andrew Chin and Morris Graves who later also became highly acclaimed artists. By the 1970s, Sudakawa was internationally recognized 
as a major modern artist. And he continued to influence and shape contemporary art throughout his long and renowned career until his passing in 1997. In 1973, Sudakawa honored Seattle Central Community College with this fountain, one of only 70 fountain works that the artist produced worldwide and the only one installed at a community college. Crafted at the height of Seattle's 70s grassroots equality movements, Fountain serves as a reminder of our institution's Japanese American past, Sudakawa's roots in a community whose presence was devastated by injustice, and the struggles for social justice embraced by Seattle Central students. Sudakawa said of his work, I am consciously or subconsciously trying to create something permanent that defies identity with any epoch or civilization. His vision of transcending rigid definitions of identity and his hope for the emergence of a cosmopolitan community is reflected in the presence of Fountain at Seattle Central College. So this is a campaign that went on for several years. Um, in um, a documents folder that I found with great relief, um, <laughs> I found minutes that go back to 2012. And I found one of our last meetings, June of 2014, where we were actually tallying up how close we were to the 40,000 that we committed to raise in order to have a fund that would restore the fountain and help to support its maintenance. Students were a really key part. At one point, they were collecting signatures on a petition. There were students who made a little button so we could wear a little fountain buttons. And there was even um, a student leader who helped to uh, persuade the um, Associated Student Council, along with many letters of support from community organizations, artists and community leaders, to contribute 9,000 into that 40,000 that we were aiming for. This was a committee that was uh, chaired by Tina Young, yay, and participated with staff, faculty, students, a lot of different people in the course of those two years, but we kept it going. Bikihara was, mm, well, she was definitely a supporter. I am not remembering exactly all of her role, but, um, and certainly without community support, we could not have met our goals. And this, I know it's like, who took that photo? Yeah, it was me. Um, and it, it well, it, it's on my office wall and yeah, it's all faded out. But I love thinking about this particular uh, evening of music memory and interlude, because when we consider the various performers and how they were connected to the history um, of the Japanese community or the history of Seattle Central, it is really remarkable. Um, one of uh, George's sons was uh, a, a um, beloved music instructor and conductor at Garfield High School. And so we were very lucky to get one of the groups that he um, was a mentor to, um, the Bach Street Boys of Garfield High School, uh, and Deem Surakawa, another brother, uh, pulled together a trio um, who, um, and one of those musicians, Dan Benson, was married to um, Sally Yamasaki, former instructor in basic studies. Yay! <laughs> so all kinds of community connections, a truly remarkable evening of both music and sharing and fundraising. And then, gosh, can I make this move out of the way? No, I just can put it more in the way. Um, so I wanted every all of us to look at this extraordinary symbol. It's continued to be used in many days of remembrances. Um, the designer, artist, Frank Fuji, was a former 
employee at Seattle Central. And when I first started teaching as an adjunct, he greeted me, um, took me out to coffee, sat me down to just help me get a little bit oriented. And he told me, well, I'm the affirmative action officer. Wow. So we are talking history. In that symbol, he incorporated the um, uh, Japanese um, calligraphy for first, second, and third generation, Issei, Nisei, Sansei. And then we see the barbed wire that intertwines closely. Um, and, um, and I think that's for, we can interpret that in so many ways, the intergenerational trauma, um, the barbed wire of that injustice and that experience of incarceration um, and imprisonment um, and the continuing struggle to learn from that history. So thinking again about what Nathaniel shared on um, memories and the power of that remembrance. <clears throat> the president uh, back in of the college back in 2012, Paul Kilpatrick, was initially surprisingly, disappointingly disinterested in this interest in restoring the fountain. And his first reaction in a meeting with, that we held with him was, is this so expensive? And you know, it might just be better to sell it off. He wasn't interested in learning more about George Sudakawa why the fountain was donated to the college and seemed singularly disconnected, very disconnected from the Asian community and communities of color. But in spite of the position that he initially took, the fountain committee just kept going on and we were successful in raising our money, successful in scheduling a whole phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on to um, change out the pump and do cleaning, descaling, um, protecting that space. And it really was only possible because of reconnecting with the community and organizing um, with all of us. And I do want to make a comparison to the recent other organizing that prevented the closure of the four professional and technical programs. So I'll just finish my part by posing us a couple of questions. I hope you all have some ideas. How are we going to archive the social justice struggles that have been, they're embedded, they're part of who who Seattle Central is. And I threw in a couple of images to just kind of remind that there are archives that other institutions have that include parts of our story, but when will we get the institutional resources so that we can have our own freedom archives at Seattle Central Library? So the image, if it's a little too small print for you, is the student newspaper. I hope some of you are noticing that there's a, oh, you can't actually, I'm sorry, my screenshot got cut off, but if you were to scroll down, pretend you can scroll down into the archives, there is a huge gap because the student newspaper also went through a very big struggle and ended up getting shutting down for a time. And if you've ever wondered, why aren't we teaching journalism classes at Seattle Central? It's connected to that struggle. And then um, this tiny screenshot, University of Washington has a um, World Trade Organization history project, the WTO history project. And if you go through the interviews, you will see Seattle Central students who are part of that mix. I am looking forward to talking with all of you. So I am stopping share. So now is the time, y'all, to um, turn the COSI into a conversation. The C in COSI stands for conversation. Um, we have these amazing questions that Tracy left us with, which I put in the chat. How will we archive our social justice struggles at Seattle Central, Seattle Colleges? I know not all of y'all are from Seattle Central. 
um, Tracy also prompted us to think about when will we get institutional resources for our stories and archives? I think there are folks in the room with power over institutional resources who might want to weigh in on that. Um, yes, Tina Young, I think Tina down there in the square is Tina Young. We would love to hear your voice because you have so much rich experience at Central and with the fight for the Sudakawa Fountain. Um, and then Tracy and Nathaniel also put together a question, more general question. Um, what, what are archives and their potential impact to you, to Seattle Central or Seattle Colleges? So feel free to respond to any question if you feel so moved um, or ask a question. You can put your little Zoom hand up or type stack in the chat. Would love to hear from you. Nina. Hey, I'm going to uh, start my video. Hi, everyone, to the folks that I do know. Um, thanks, Tracy, for, for sending me this. Hi, Katie. Hey, I, I see people's names. Um, I've already exchanged with Zola. So um, I just want to say thank you so much for, for doing this. I'm sorry that I missed the first half. I was trying to get home as quickly as possible. I'm going to um, move to a space that's kind of scary. And I figure at this point, since I'm retired from the Seattle colleges, I can pretty much say whatever the heck I want to say. And so whatever you all want to do with it, you can do with it. I have no one that I report to, no president, no vice president, who's going to say, oh, Tina, what the heck are you saying now? Um, I think that it's really incredibly important, not only say for my dear sister friend, Tracy Lai and myself and the things that we have engaged in, because I was saying to her, yeah, remember the lab school, remember the daycare center, remember the struggles that we had trying to save um, childcare for, for students and also for us as staff and faculty, but also, the importance of childcare on site and the struggles, the institutional struggles that we met with. I mean, things like that up to the Sudakawa Fountain, up to the recent attempts to close school. My, my voice is really, and I think I said this to Tracy, I think it's all about real estate. I think that Seattle Central, the main building, is sitting on amazing real estate. I think wood technology is sitting on amazing real estate. Marine tech is sitting on waterfront. Th this is a city that's in rapid, rapid economic transition and not necessarily for the people who have lived here for such a long time. Um, and, and I think the archiving and the, the, the collection of, of individual and group memory and institutional memory is so important to also counter some of those potential future forces at work, or maybe they're being un, put under consideration right now um, in terms of long-term plans. When I say real estate, you know, I'm talking about the sale of this valuable real estate for apartment buildings that can house lots of people. Um, so that's my two cents and for the importance of um, memory and movement making. And I just love Tracy hearing you center community because how we define community in our different spaces is so critical. And I think that the Sudakawa Fountain effort, and I agree with you, the last effort had so much to do with community. However, that got mobilized. So thanks very much. Thanks for letting me throw in my two cents. Thank you, Tina. 
Thank you so much, Tina. I want to read what Michaela wrote in the chat. I think it's so interesting how social activism has transformed over the years. I think social media has been vital in making movements accessible to communities. I don't have an answer, but I think the intersection is intriguing and can influence what it means to preserve and archive progressive movements. I love that, Michaela, thank you. Hey, Katie, as a, as a panelist, can I pose a question to, to Nathaniel? Of course. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so I am really interested in how, how, you, how you may feel transformed as an archivist since you've been in the, in the years that you've been working with Freedom Archives, um, because well, I'm thinking about how there's sort of that formal training, you know, that is part of graduate school and those kinds of experiences. But then, and then you're part of this um, evolving nonprofit organization. So, um, if if you care to share a few thoughts on that, thanks. That's a that's a very interesting question where I'm gonna, I both, I'm sure I have tons to say and also would not struggle to come up with one or two things, but I think part of when I'm, I think part of when I'm reflecting on some of the, the training of being an archivist versus the actual work of, you know, uh, providing resources to empower communities. I, I one thing I think about is the the real focus on um, kind of like uh, let's see, demystifying kind of. Um, I, I guess I would just say demystifying history, right? So whether that be the and that can manifest itself in many many ways for I think anybody in a learning environment. And so I'll just name a couple things, I guess, that have been demystified to me. Um, so I think first, you know, the moving away, I guess the first one I would highlight is as much of an emphasis on unlearning as on learning. And so I think that in so many learning environments, whether they be classrooms or archives or library spaces, there's a focus on acquiring some set of facts one way or the other. And that with the acquisition of said facts, you'll be better uh, positioned to accomplish whatever the goal is. And I think that actually unlearning that is as important because it really allows us to think about knowledge and the impact it can have on people in a more kind of humanizing way, as opposed to a more transactional um, prioritization of, of knowledge as opposed to experience. And so uh, one example that I think about is uh, in terms of movement making, uh, people who are locked inside of prisons who don't really have as robust of a public voice, if any public voice at all, uh, you know, the, the knowledge that they in fact are, the struggles that they engage in are as impactful to setting the standards for movements on the outside as is movements on the outside responsible for transforming conditions inside or the idea that the rank and file of the Black Panther Party who were providing childcare and free food were as impactful as transforming society as Huey Noden and Angela Davis, just as random name examples. Um, so I'd say unlearning is key. The other thing that I would say is um, really focusing on human perspective and experience and the way that that can uh, encourage our learnings. And so I think, again, in, in, in most intellectual settings that we find ourselves in, whether or not we're prioritizing like the perspectives of white land and men, 
or whether or not we've opened up to allow for the perspectives of other peoples, regardless of how they identify, this focus on individuals, where, you know, um, I think, you know, again, a piece that is important. And, you know, when we were doing this film, it became so apparent in talking with people who were in the movement was that so many things were about collective and it wasn't about individuals one way or the other, it's the collective energy of people trying to make change. And again, so focusing on when we think about movement and how change happens, does change happen because of individual and individual actions or does it happen because we're transforming material conditions for larger sets of people whose names we may never know one way or the other. Um, so I, I would just leave it as those two examples because at least I gave neat examples. But I think that in you know two of the things that I've learned through the practice as opposed to just the the kind of uh, intellectual skill set, you know, is the focus on unlearning and really focus on humanizing individuals, uh, and that that is as important as any kind of piece of the archival training uh, that that someone might learn in schools. Thank you for that. That that was a that was a good slash hard question. <laughs> okay, I just have to urge all my colleagues. This is why, this is so why when we're doing library workshops and research methods and all of that. So just, just point everybody to Freedom Archives, freedomarchives.org. <laughs> but but really what Nathaniel talked about, because I think um, I, I've had far too many students who are just, they come to class and the first thing is kind of a yawn, you know, and a lot of that yawning, the boredom is because the lack of humanize, humanization of knowledge and individuals and experiences and you know the efforts for collective change, the narrative, that dominant narrative just pretty much sucks the life out of you know what they're looking at. And they just are like, oh, hum, how, how do I pass? And I just, it's like, no, 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 this is your story too. But, but they need convincing and they need to be able to see it. So Freedom Archives. <laughs> I wanna provide space for any of y'all in the audience to, to ask any questions or answer any of the questions that we pose to you. And if, if you do, that would be preferred. And if you don't, I'm gonna to have to think about a question to ask Tracy. So if nothing else, y'all could help me out. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna sit here for a second and then uh, and leave it to y'all. And if not, I'll, I'll say something. Dave's on stack, go Dave Elmwood. I was really waiting for other people to jump in there, but I was like, I waited five seconds or so. Please, other folks jump in too. But one of the themes this is more of a comment, but maybe something you all could build on if you want. But one of the themes I really noticed across both of your uh, sections was this sort of um, theme of folks at the top of an institution trying to brush past or ignore or uh, underfund or, um, hide maybe uh, certain cultural moments, important movement moments, and that tension with just the everyday folks who um, make up the, the institution pushing back and saying, no, this is actually what's important to us. And, you know, I think we're seeing this now. One of the, the ways I've heard a lot of faculty talk about the single accreditation struggle that's happening right now is we're getting rid of the rich cultural curriculum that has been at Central for decades and decades uh, to have some um, singular curriculum that, can, that, that students could experience anywhere, right? Instead of something that's really rooted in, in, um, in our, on our campuses and that this, these pushes come from the top and not from uh, the people teaching this. So it's just a tension that I was noticing in both. And I, I appreciate both of you highlighting the 
the um, the resistance and the vision that comes from just folks trying to make sure that they do justice to uh, the the history of their institution and their community um, in a in a wide range of ways. So I don't know if you want to speak to that tension or you can just leave it at that. But and maybe other folks may have questions. I'd love to hear from Michaela, who has stack. Oh, mine was a little like slightly different, but Dave, thank you for your comment because it kind of led me to, but it, it is separate. So I want to give the panelists an opportunity to respond to that comment question. We'll, we'll get Dave at the end. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. <laughs> um, I was, and so my, I guess my question slash comment is coming from what has been taking place in the country. It's been a really rough couple of weeks. Um, also, hi everyone, Michaela Harris. I work in the EDI office. And so I've been, I do feel a responsibility to stay on top of current events. And, you know, there are a lot of events to stay current on, unfortunately. And so from y'all's perspective, and when it comes to like archiving, information and social movements, and given what Dave was talking about, where we have like higher ups, upper administration, the government, you know, the principal, the whomever, um, trying to really squash down the voices. How do you see either archiving footage and what I saw was like art being really motivating and like an inspiration to keeping, you know, keeping hope, I guess, especially in a time where things feel incredibly hopeless. How do you think, and once again, from my perspective, what do you think your role, or where do you think we should move towards um, when it comes to archiving progressive moments when things feel really bleak? What is the role of archiving this information? What is the role of art archival um, during these times? And I know that might be more of a personal thing, but you can relate it to either the work that you're doing or kind of how you feel about that in general. Jason, you want to go first? Thank you for the question. Oh, that's a great question, Michaela. Um, well, I think that um, art and music often can convey um, maybe even more than the wonderful flyers and position statements. And oh my goodness, I have a large collection of statements I've made to the Board of Trustees but I am thinking about art at the next one, uh, June 9th, Board of Trustees. <laughs> Dave's laughing. He's like, oh, you had to try and fit that in. Um, and, and, and I do think, um, well, and, and I, uh, I, I think we'll be doing a lot more digital archiving. That's easier um, than how do I go back and scan reams of whatever, whatever we had collected. Um, although there's still information in those as well. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what will happen to some of those older forms of, of types of records. Um, but I think that um, that can be an important kind of continuity um, with um, next generation, um, you know, and not, not, I mean, I think it's actually in any given mo movement, there's kind of more of a continuum, new people coming in, kind of intergenerational in the sense that some people who are in that movement may have kind of a continuous thread, you know, that goes pretty far back. Um, and so I think that um, art and music can help to, um, express and, and keep those kinds of connections. Nathaniel? I would agree with that. And um, I also think people can engage with art and music no matter what their, I don't wanna say pre-existing political knowledge, but like you can feel the impact of art and music whether you might be an expert on a particular event or first engaging a particular event. And so I think that's also why it has such a intense ability to move people. Um, the one piece I would say about the kind of the news piece um, and 
you know, obviously as I, I clearly, uh, whether or not I literally feel the same way as you do or not, I obviously can easily understand where you are coming from as someone who also engages the world and certainly to all the things you're saying. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, I think that, I think about two things. Uh, the first thing I think about is there's what events are happening, which might be depressing or challenging, right, and overwhelming, but then there's the how they're being talked about. And I think that how they're being talked about is hopeless for a reason, because po the power structures that convey the news want us to think that, not that there's nothing we can do about it, but they want us to feel powerless, because when you feel powerless, you, you are less apt to act. And if you feel like, oh, if, if we just do this and this and this, we, we might be able to solve this challenge, it's a whole different way of engaging. So I don't think that there's a, so I think that there's a connection between the way in which things get framed and the way in which we think of, we think about how our position related to that is. The other piece I would say is, while it's hard to be optimistic, the, before the Cuban revolution, if you had asked a Cuban, would they ever have free healthcare and education? You know, they would probably say no. If you would talk to a Vietnamese person before they defeated the US empire, the idea that they would defeat the US empire would be impossible. Or if you would talk to an enslaved African on a plantation in the United States, the idea that we would be free would seem impossible, right? And yet all of those things became possible. And so I also think that that's where partially the rootedness in the past is important, not because, oh, the past has all the answers, but that when you know that, in fact, struggles that seemed impossible are, in fact, possible, it totally revolutionizes the way in which you see your potential in the world one way or the other. So I would just say that yes to the feeling overwhelmed about the way things are and also that our capacity to change the world is as possible as any other person's throughout history. And certainly historically, we've seen massive changes in human society. So I feel optimistic that we could also see that. What that looks like, I do not know. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I feel optimistic that that could happen. Um, that, that, that's a really, I appreciate that question. Thanks for raising that. Thank you all. Um, Tina, just put something in the chat that I want to read. Patrice Cullors, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, sorry, speaks of the need for us to, quote, create portals of joy. I think that joy, as we despair, experiencing local, national, and global developments is one of those somatic sensory activators to support our human need for hope. And Oh, sorry, as self and preventive care is so essential, so is joy. Wow, that's amazing, Tina, thank you. Um, I had stacked earlier, I, I wanna just add one thing to Michaela's question, um, maybe to wrap it up. I think as I look around our building, you know, life is coming back and just thinking about before COVID, the art is there, the music is there. Our students and our faculty and our staff are producing amazing things all the time. And when I think about that and think about your question, Michaela, it really brings home Tracy's question, which is like, where is the place to put it so that we can do what Nathaniel is talking about, which is like, tell our story keep our story and tell it the way that we want it to be told, where we see joy and we see love and we see the life of our institution and our history. Um, and we don't let <laughs> the administration or the media or whoever wants to tell our story in a different way, we don't let that happen. And so that it can catalyze like the movement and change that we, we know we need. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll... Maybe we end there. If anyone has anything else, we can stick around. I, I will also say thank you so much and so deeply to Nathaniel 
for being here. For Tracy, to Tracy for taking time being here, sharing our story. Tina Young, so nice to have you here and all of you. There is a guide that the library creates that's a mini COSI archive where you can find this talk, the recording of it, um, links to the slides, links to the film that Nathaniel was talking about um, and to Freedom Archives. Anything else y'all wanna put there, let me know. And I'll stop talking. Yes, absolutely, Tina, I can send you a link to the recording. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to push the red button, everyone. Wait, 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 wait. Nathaniel, I'm really sorry that I missed your presentation. I was trying to get home as soon as quick as I could because, um, you know, Tracy says, oh, log on to this, you know, at the last minute, I'm going, oh, oh, but thanks so much. I, I, I 